will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions, and you have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Section one: You will hear Kevin Brown asking for information about renting an apartment through an agency. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Hello. My name's Kevin Brown. I saw your advertisement in today's local paper: apartments to let in all areas of the city. Yes, Mr. Brown.、Uh, we currently have several properties available. What part of the city were you thinking of? Well, city centre, ideally. Okay. And what price range are you interested in? Um, I don't really know. What have you got? Well,、uh, prices start at four hundred pounds a month, going up to a thousand pounds a month. Okay. And what's the difference? What does the price depend on? Well,、uh, the number of bedrooms mainly.、Uh -huh. The cheaper apartments have one bedroom, while the most expensive have three or four bedrooms. Okay, two bedrooms would be nice. So I'll say two bedrooms up to six hundred a month.、Uh -huh. Do you have anything like that? Right, sir. We have.、Uh, just give me a moment, please.、Mm -hmm. um, Uh, we have two properties that might interest you. One is in North Street. It's、uh, well, it's、uh, it's a very nice apartment,、uh, but it's seven hundred and fifty pounds a month.、Uh, but that includes a private parking space. Hmm, seven fifty. That's a bit higher than I'd like to go. Really, do you have anything less expensive? Uh, yes. Uh... Uh, we have another one at six hundred and twenty-five pounds a month. Six hundred and twenty-five.、Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. Where is it? It's in Cornell Road, at number twelve B. I don't know that. How do you spell it? It's C O R N E L L. It's near the park. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it on a map. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. So, would you like to see the apartment, sir? Yes, I would. I'd like to rent somewhere fairly soon.、Mm -hmm. Would tomorrow be possible? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm afraid nobody is available all day tomorrow. It's quite a busy time of year for us. I see. But if you're free later today, you could see it at five fifteen. Sure, no problem. I could manage that. Okay, so that'll be five、uh, fifteen with my colleague Jason.、Hmm. He'll meet you at the apartment. That's fine. And one more thing: what do I need to provide to rent an apartment with you? What documents? That kind of thing. Yes, of course.、Um, do you have a job? Yes, I work in a travel agency. Well,、uh, a reference letter from your employer, you know, saying you work for them, and a deposit, which is one month's rent plus a fee of sixty pounds. 
What's that for? It's an administration fee to cover the cost of preparing the contract. OK. And one last thing. When would this apartment be available? It's empty now, so you could move in as soon as the contract was signed. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr Brown. <laughs> That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Test 2, Section 2. You will hear a member of the local council describing plans to redevelop part of the seafront of a coastal town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening, everybody. I wasn't expecting to see so many people. Clearly, this is an issue of great local interest. Thank you all for coming. Well, as you all know, I've come to talk about the Council's plans for redeveloping the western part of the seafront. Firstly, of course, the Queen's Parade shopping centre is to be demolished. It was built on the cheap and in a hurry in 1953 and recently came third in a national newspaper's ugliest buildings in the country list. So I don't think anybody's going to miss it. The question was, what do we replace it with? Well, after consultations with the local community, we decided, as I'm sure most of you are aware, to replace it with a complex of small shops and workshops, plus a three-screen cinema. We particularly didn't want another bland glass and steel shopping centre full of the same old chain stores as every other town centre. No, this is our chance to do something just a little bit different. I'll start at the top. On the third floor will be a cafe and a restaurant. Part of this will be open air, so people can enjoy a meal or a cup of coffee in the fresh air, weather permitting, of course. Below this will be the cinema. And below that, on the first floor, will be some much needed council offices. We're getting very cramped in the town hall, I can assure you. On the ground floor will be 20 small shop units, ranging in size from 20 to 50 square metres. Also on the ground floor will be five workshop spaces, which we hope will attract small manufacturing businesses back to the town centre, providing some additional local employment. Underneath the centre will be an underground car park, not a great big car park like in the present centre. Our aim is that most visitors to the centre will come on foot or by bus. In fact, the car park will be restricted to people working in the centre and disabled visitors. Then, and perhaps this is the most exciting part of the project, the beach in front of the new complex is going to be completely transformed. We're going to extend the beach. Yes, extend it. 10,000 tonnes of sand is going to be brought in to make it into a proper beach instead of the dirty little strip of sand it is now. 
as well as being for the enjoyment of local people, we're hoping that a decent beach will attract more visitors to the town and that has to be good for local businesses. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I must emphasise that these plans have not yet been finalised. That's what this meeting is about. Of course, it's vital with a project like this that we have the support of local people. After all, we work for you and it's your money that's paying for it. So, first of all, the plans for the new centre are going to go on display in the Town Hall. They'll be there from Monday the 5th of March until Friday the 6th of April. Uh, plenty of time for anybody who's interested to get over there and have a look at them, I think. There'll be a suggestions box in the same room as the plans. Anybody who has anything to say is welcome to fill in a suggestions form. These forms will be looked at and taken seriously. You can be sure of that. Then on Tuesday, April the 10th, there'll be another public meeting much like this one and in this same place. It'll start at seven o'clock and there'll be a chance for local residents to address the council. We'll also report back to you on the results gathered in the suggestions box. Anyway, I'd now like to hand you over to my colleague, my fellow councillor. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did, yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. 
and we had an individual task too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year, depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one, so my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but while you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I am about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering? Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really helped to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. 
You will hear a historian giving a presentation about techniques to identify the origin of handwritten books from the Middle Ages. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period, that is, the period between the 5th and 15th centuries AD. As many of you know, thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today. Some of them have a clear provenance, that is, we know exactly where and when they were written. But the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery, that is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheepskin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calfskin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, 
involving very large-scale movements right across the globe. The new data in turn help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium. Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.